Very good. Well, thank you, Sharon, and welcome everybody to webinar 001 of 2023, Best Practices. Um, this is an interesting session in that we're really going to be looking at primarily kind of a 10,000 foot view of student manager and ACE web. And the, the kind of things we're going to be talking about uh, are a, a lot of, I guess you could call them meta things if that word has not been overused, uh, but uh, kind of some big picture ideas. Uh, and we're, some of it might even be esoteric. Um, again, I note that the ones who are signed, who are logged in right now, we've got a lot of senior uh, senior Aceware users, Lynn and Marsha, Carolyn, uh, Brenda, they've been around for a while. Uh, so, so some of this stuff perhaps has uh, long since been part of your DNA, but I don't think it's bad to kind of review it and uh, uh, make sure we're, we're up to date. Uh, and for those of you that are into, uh, again, more practical things, we do have, I have added here at the end, Chuck's Hidden Gems. So uh, if you'll hang in there to the end, we'll be talking about some big picture items. Uh, we will be getting into a handful of some favorite items that I think are, are, are good for any student manager user. So, all right, well, let's go ahead and kind of get this show on the road. Um, vision, mission, and goals. And, and I was going to say, no, I am not your dean or, or not your vice provost, but it, this really is something that I presumably you all have kind of already done as you uh, began to roll out student manager, because I think we've got a couple of brand new uh, directors here, but uh, most of you have, have been around uh, but the idea of what exactly you're doing here uh, ties to, again, vision for the unit. Uh, you know, what, what is the vision that your unit uh, has? Does it have a mission statement? Do you have goal set one year, five year? You say, well, yeah, that's big picture items. What does student manager have to do with it? Well, the mission that you have uh, and again, well, let's let's kind of stay back with this idea of what are you doing? Do you know why you were doing what you were doing? We're going to kind of circle back to that um, is service to students first. Now, obviously, your mission, your uh, again, uh, people who are keeping track of you will be driving that. Uh, but do you have special populations you are targeting? Uh, whether that's a mission or market, uh, what things do you count? And this is the area here that I think is key to this whole vision, mission, uh, goals issue, because you basically will want to set up your student manager. And again, uh, not to overlook this uh, more important item, what are the things that you, people that you report to count? And again, so that means what are the things that you're going to need to track in your student manager system in order to give that data to uh, your, your, uh, your stakeholders or your administrators uh, that are responsible for your, uh, uh, your success or that might determine your, your role there at the institution. Uh, and that then leads us to, well, if you've got your mission identified, you know what you're counting, then you set up the codes in student manager to be able to track that. And again, this is the old gigo. Uh, well, garbage in, garbage out. But the other thing is I said it would be no go. In other words, if you have no, uh, no goals as far as what it is you're tracking, or if you have a particular goal and you don't have a code to track it, then you it's a no-go. You, you don't have the data inside your student manager in order to generate it and, and, and get those reports you're looking for. Um, student manager's code system it gives you all kinds of tools. And uh, um, on the name screen, for instance, obviously key codes are your interest codes. Uh, your source code, tracking code, uh, the occupation code, organization code, 
And then, of course, you have the whole panel of demographic codes. Uh, and, and of course, there are codes on the registration screen, on the course screen as well, that you can use to, again, record the data that's going to help you generate the reports to meet the goals and to serve your, pardon this, masters, to serve your administrators uh, in the way that uh, they're going to expect uh, to have the information. Uh, so again, the interest codes identify areas of interest. Uh, for mailing lists, for email blasts. Um, and again, to note that the interest code for the name and the course subject matter codes are the same ones. And of course, you remember that when you assign an interest, a subject code to a course, and for new staff or new folks, make sure you're, you, 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 you bear this down. If you put that, inter, that subject code on a course, Whenever a student enrolls, they'll get that name assigned to their interest codes. Um, so again, that's a key element for marketing uh, blasts, whether it's uh, mail marketing, email marketing, or, or voicemail, you know, telephone marketing, uh, that is key. Uh, another one that I certainly want to uh, highlight is the source code tracking code. Uh, and again, the idea here is that you want to try to track how people found out about your courses and what was the promotion? What was the thing you spent money on or spent effort on that brought that student into the database, into a particular course? And again, so on the name screen, the source code is called the source code. On the register screen, it's called the uh, tracking code. But again, that's the same set of codes. So if you had, you know, the local Du Bois uh, State Idahoan, um, you would have uh, the same code. Uh, Boise State, Boise State would be, or BSID would be in in both of these screens. It'd share the same database. Uh, other codes, certainly organization code, which is the type of a company a person has or is employed by. Occupation code, again, these are probably, again, more valuable if you're doing business to business or you're doing professional programs than, than personal interest or uh, avocational ones. Uh, demographic codes, again, lots of demographic codes available to you uh, that if, if your institution is needing um, data about populations, uh, you can certainly track that. Uh, and again, uh, note about the codes, and we'll cover this in, in preferences in a bit. Several of these codes can be, actually most of the codes out there, can be relabeled and used for data specific to your group, what you're interested in. So again, if you don't record marital status and but want to know if they're an alumnus or not, you could relabel it and use it to track alumni uh, status. Okay, moving on to Keeper of the Flame. And I know we have several of you out there who are uh, Keepers of the Flame or have been Keepers of the Flame. And again, what we what we indicate here is that this is the person uh, at a installation at a school that's running student manager or NACE web, who's primarily responsible for managing the systems. And again, um, if you back in the old days of the Xerox machines, uh, where you had a master of the Xerox machine, it was whoever had the key to the Xerox machine, that would be the equivalent of the keeper of the flame. They're the, they're the ones kind of running that. Um, we really, well, every, every unit should have a keeper of the flame. Um, this person is responsible for liaison between the school and ACEWARE, uh, setting up and helping configure student manager, assigning codes, setting up users, installing upgrades, training for new users, and as the primary communication with the ACEWARE tech. Uh, and again, ACEWARE, uh, obviously, if, if there's a keeper of the flame at your institution, uh, we would prefer that that keeper of the flame be the contact whenever there's a technical issue. But 
uh, if if there is a problem that you're having and the keeper of the flame or the primary ACE work contact is is not around, uh, you certainly can call directly to ACEWARE for technical help. So uh, you, you, you are not re restricted to only having one contact. We just prefer, you know, there's the one person that kind of knows more about who does what, when, where uh, would be the one that we kind of stay in touch with. Um, in general, uh, again, sometimes say, well, does a keeper of the flame need any kind of special abilities? Uh, do they need to be a hardcore IT person? And I don't, I don't think so. And, and again, if you've got thoughts or comments on that, feel free to drop them in chat. But that um, generally what we're looking for in the keeper of the flame is someone who is willing to get their, uh, get dirt behind the fingernails with getting into the software, uh, trying to, become, if you would, a, a scholar of, of all things student manager and ACEWeb so that uh, there is a person in your institution who is aware of all of the features uh, and all of the different things that ACEWeb and student manager can do. And, and honestly, I was, I took a couple weeks off at Christmas. I come back, look through the help guide, and I see three or four things in there that honestly I missed somewhere this last fall. Uh, so again, uh, not that I'm the, the world's best upper keeper on Aceware, but if a staff member who's kind of in the middle of things misses upgrades and misses new features, certainly you guys, uh, you know, that that's something not every user would expect to know. So that's where the keeper of the flame uh, is supposed to try to stay up to date because you don't want to miss a feature that might have been in student manager for three or four months or years just because you forgot to turn it on in the preferences and you weren't aware what it did. All right. Again, if you've got um, other thoughts or comments on um, Keeper of the Flame, again, drop them in the notes. Okay, test or a sandbox copy. I, I know several of you do have those, but one of the things we do recommend if you can do it is create a test copy of Student Manager using real data. In other words, uh, for the standard uh, VFP uh, Student Manager, you can just simply copy the Student Manager folder uh, that has the SM8 executable and the database files, copy it to a local drive on a computer, uh, yours or a general office one, and then you can use that machine to experiment with new features. Uh, if you've never done things like invoicing and you want to try it, try it out on data that you're familiar with, that's why having a, a copy of your live data is uh, really helpful when you're, when you're doing that. Uh, and the other thing, and I, the idea of this comment here, importing mailing lists. Um, one of the things we run into a lot is people try to import a mailing list and they screw up or they, they, they get a field mislabeled and you get 20,000 records in the database that are wrong. It can be cleaned up, but obviously, if you had a test bed, you could try it in the test bed, verify the data is in OK, and then uh, use that same import into your live system. Uh, again, for new users, uh, it's a great practice tool uh, because they can kind of see real data, real looking data, or I should say they can see actual data uh, in a uh, test environment or practice environment. And so they can uh, get familiar with the system uh, and not letting them run around with um, uh, live live bodies try as they're trying to learn. Um, one of the elements about this, and again, a big, big, big warning is that when you, if you do make a test copy, do be careful to uh, not have a user or you yourself accidentally open that and begin putting in real data entry. That's disappointing to spend two days doing data entry and realize that you were doing it in the test system. Uh, one of the suggestions on this is that you delete all old existing users 
and create a new bogus user or a test user uh, that only exists in this um, uh, sample test copy. Um, again, uh, if you're running a SQL version, that's uh, not quite as simple as just copying a directory. So do get with your Aceware tech and they can give you some tools and some uh, assistance in creating a SQL test copy. Sharon, I'm gonna pause for a second. Uh, I don't see chat, but do you have any add-ons or questions so far? We haven't had any questions, but for those who might be watching this on demand, I have reminded folks that we have a great white paper on coding that I'll send out in a follow-up and that we also have Keeper of the Flame resources in our help guide on um, tips and tricks for keepers. So. Absolutely. Keep that in mind very, as well. very good. All right. Test copy. Uh, operational issues. And, and this is uh, getting more into getting hands on the keyboard kind of stuff. But um, and again, if you're the keeper of the flame, then this is the kind of stuff that I would expect you to try to encourage your staff members uh, who are using uh, student manager to try to implement these. Uh, so again, things like shortcut keys, setting up your preferences uh, and understanding preferences and, and use some of the macro keys that exist. Uh, shortcut keys are listed on the menu. So uh, when that is, that would give you, if from the main menu of the student manager, this is the course uh, sub menu, uh, if I wanted to add a new course from the main menu, uh, rather than using the mouse clicking module courses add, I could do alt plus C from the keyboard and that'll automatically open up the new course screen. Uh, the F1 key is your shortcut to the shortcut keys. Uh, it not only has uh, the keyboard shortcuts, but it references some of the uh, tools that I love, uh, I love the most, uh, which are your your F key reports, uh, and uh, we'll we'll hit a couple of those in a bit. Um, and again, if you want to download the full set of shortcut keys, there is a doc on the website. Uh, preferences. One of the things about Student Manager is uh, wonderful and also. I don't know, terrifying at the same time is how many choices you have. Uh, I actually did a count just on the preferences screen, not counting some of the others. And there are over 400 different settings that you can set up uh, within the preferences that will determine how you record the data, the fields for the data, a behavior of the system, permissions that people are gonna have, uh, so again, there, there are a lot of things in here that will affect your system. And so again, uh, one of the things I strongly encourage is that you, you try to do your homework on that. Um, general issues about preferences. Uh, one of the preferences that you have for each of the database screens, name, course, registration, is that you can uncheck or hide or disable fields that you don't use. So if you're a applicational program that does community ed or personal interest courses, probably maybe the person's job title isn't a big deal for you. So you could uncheck job title uh, on the name screen. Uh, review behavior preferences. This is kind of like uh, it's 11 o'clock. Do you know what setting X is doing for you? Uh, do you know what that setting can do for you? Well, that again, uh, in a lot of these areas, there is a uh, pop-up help kind of a, what do you say, tool tip that gives you a tip of what that does. If you're not sure on that, check your help guide. Set your organization information. I think that's generally done when we start up a system. Uh, if you're using AceWeb, set the AceWeb URL on the main page of your preferences. Um, you can choose your preferred browser. Uh, again, uh, by default, I think Student Manager uses the Edge, the Microsoft Edge. But if you prefer Chrome or, or, or Firefox, uh, you can define that as your preferred browser. And again, 
each different user is actually able to define their own. So, um, you know, if you're a hardcore Chrome and everybody else is a Firefox, no problem. You can do that. Uh, Want a top dog of preferences? Again, you can take any that you, that is a system administrator, can take any particular user's preferences and apply that to all users in the system or even to subsets of users. Uh, there is a set as preferences option on your tool software maintenance to do that. And as I mentioned earlier, still have questions about what a preference does, go to the help guide. The help guide has a pretty thorough uh, and detailed set of, of uh, clues on all the different things you can do with the help guide. So. Again, if if there's a if there's an area that you want to review or kind of get back on that, uh, do uh, type it in the chat menu, and Sharon will Sharon will bring that across my bow because uh, we're we're moving right along here. So preferences, all right. Uh, macro keys. Well, what are the macro keys on the primary screen? Uh, there's a set of Alt plus keys there. And there are many more, but this is a this is a, a subset. So what do these do or what can you do with these? The Alt F1 key is a key one in that it records, uh, it remembers the last code, course code entered, whether you're putting up a query, i.e. course code begins with, or if you are editing a course record or the course code from the last registration added. So once you start using student manager, you'll actually see this. If you were to go to preferences, this would have this would have had the course number of the last course you added, edited, registered for, or put in course number in a course number begins with uh, query field. Alt F2. Alt F2 is a uh, last text value entered into a query field. And so if you're doing a query for a location and you typed in a particular location and you wanna go back and run that report again, when you get to the spot that says enter location data, uh, if it's a character field, Alt F2 will repeat the last text value that you entered when you're doing query. Alt F3, F4, and F5 are basically, um, basically uh, storage boxes that you can type in a message or a string of letters uh, or a set of uh, dates. I like to use it for a beginning and ending year um, that you can repeat uh, by just into, enter it into whatever field that you're, uh, uh, you're, you're putting that into. Uh, so that is uh, for repeatable data. Shift F2. And this is one that I hope you guys use, is that it allows you to stamp today's date into a date field, whether it's on a record or on a query. So if, if you're running queries that say, you know, uh, or that you're interested in how many registrations came in today and it says registration date equals date, you can just do shift F2 and it'll stamp that date uh, into uh, that particular uh, query field. Uh, again, um, these these are edited. Alt F1, Alt F2 are system tracked, system track set. Uh, these uh, three text blobs are ones you control. You edit it, put in there whatever you want. Um, and again, so the idea, if you're entering the same boilerplate data every time in, in, in records, uh, fill it into one of the alt keys and uh, uh, be able to uh, stamp that in. Upgrades. All right. Student manager and ACE web, time to upgrade. Well, uh, the, the good news or bad news uh, or, or is that student manager does not stand still. Uh, Matthew has uh, been busy uh, every month uh, adding new features, doing some corrections, fixing some bugs. And so there's generally, I think we had we missed one month where we did kind of November and January and or December and January was kind of combined with the holidays. 
Uh, but, uh, but we did 11 upgrades to student manager uh, in the past year, basically one a month. Uh, ACE web updates don't come out quite as often. They're generally posted quarterly. Um, so how do you find out about those? You can see what each update does by going to the forums, student manager forum uh, and the ACE web forum. So uh, there's, uh, the, there are separate forums for uh, ACEWeb, for SQL, and VFP. Student Manager Forum covers both. And again, I'm going to roll to, roll to the database that if you go to the ACEWare website under Company Forums, you'll see where you've got student manager updates, student manager knowledge base, there's ACE web updates, SQL version, quick pick updates. So again, uh, it gives you an opportunity to be able to uh, keep up to date with what's going on with your uh, versions. You can subscribe to those forums so that whenever there is a new version posted, uh, you will get an email of that. And again, that the, if you go to go to the forum, scroll to the bottom, there is a subscribe forum link uh, that you can click that will you enter your email and uh, it'll automatically send you the update whenever Stein or Matthew posts an upgrade. Again, um, I have I build kind of on the side here a new goodies doc that just is a update of upgrade um, key upgrades per each version of student manager and, and some key ones on ACEWeb. So again, I think Sharon, if uh, I'll get that to you and you could send that out with that coding uh, version, because I think that's helpful. Even if you've been trying to keep up on updates, I would encourage you to uh, take a look at that new goodies, browse those topics uh, to make sure you're not forgetting uh, or you're not overlooking a new feature that would be beneficial to your program. Query management. Um, again, uh, yesterday in the director's coffee, uh, the big topic uh, was reporting. You know, how do you do reports and how you run reports? Well, some of those have to do with obviously modifying the report template and adding data fields. But when we're talking about reporting, probably as critical of, as anything is asking the right question. And that is where queries come in because your query is the uh, frontier scout that will take you to where you wanna go. Uh, so you need to be able to uh, clearly identify what data elements you're wanting to do a question about uh, in order to get, again, get the right results for what you're trying to do. Um, so uh, what are some issues in query management? Uh, one of the dilemmas is that Aceware does open up queries to let users do their own thing. And again, it's kind of like we let the inmates run the asylum and that can be you know, cause some issues. So what do you need to do? Uh, if you have queries that aren't used anymore, delete them. Again, queries have a, a number next to the query that indicates the number of times it's been used. So again, uh, periodically, uh, Keeper of the Flame uh, should take a look at those and ones that have not been used very often or haven't been used recently. Uh, you could clean it up or ask the person who created it to clean up their queries if they're not ever using them anymore. Um, this is one of the things that if you're editing queries, uh, to make sure you update the title if you edit the contents of a query. Uh, so again, um, uh, because the query title is a human thing. I mean, a, a staff member or one of your users can edit and name that title, but the dilemma is obviously you want it to more, to as accurately as possible reference uh, what the contents of that query is. So um, again, by default, queries are sorted when they're presented to a user based on how often they're used. 
Um, however, you can click on the title column header to sort them by the title instead. Uh, and there is a filter or a search mode within the queries uh, if you uh, right mouse click inside the query area. Um, and again, uh, there is a set of tools under the reports area where you can search for a data field uh, with a particular, or you can you can search for a query that is referencing a particular data field uh, that you want to search for. So I want to actually roll over to manager here. And so in terms of queries, I go to my favorite report area, deadbeat. It's not deadbeat. Alt D for deadbeat. And I hit OK, and now I'm at the queries. So again, you'll see the run count on the left. Uh, the queries are sorted by the number of times it's been run. Uh, again, by clicking on the title, you can sort it alphabetically by title. Click again, and it'll, it'll flip. It'll inverse. Ditto on run count. So again, if you've got a couple of pages of queries and you're looking for a query that you just created, if you click on the run count label, uh, then those queries that are newbies will be showing up obviously at the top. And again, as we noted uh, since, oh, it's been two, three years now, uh, whenever a query is created, the user that created it is labeled and it also indicates the last time this query was run. So again, if you're looking at cleaning up queries, uh, Keeper of the Flame, you really should have a fairly good view here. Although again, you'll note some of these that have blanks would mean that those queries were created more than, I don't know for sure, probably three or four years ago. Um, so again, if, if if we talked about uh, searching, well, if you right mouse click, it says, would you like to filter by title? Well, what that would allow you to do is if you wanted to, if you thought course code was a good search mode, we're going to say search for the title course code. And that would tell us there are no course, there are no queries in here that have course code on. So let's try that again. Uh, let's do um, end date. I did see that end date. E -E end date. Okay, so there is course end date between two dates. Um, the other way to do it is by the actual field name. So if I wanted to find a query for RegNote, I would actually type in the scientific name, the official database name for the field I want, RG RegNote. And again, I search that and RegNote contains text. That should have, I would have thought that would have given me uh, now, what I was looking for here is that when I click on a particular query, if you look at the top right of your screen, you'll note that it pops up a, a little window. Now, on my screen, it's going away in a, like a second. It should stay up until you click the mouse again. I'll, uh, I'm not sure what I'm doing here with my registration entry date to be entered later. So again, some of these, uh, here's it says registrations entered between two dates. Well, I want to edit that. And there it is, registration entry date ranges from to be entered later. So that, that does uh, match up. But again, um, by just clicking on the label, it should give you uh, that little view on the upper right, registration entry date uh, to be entered later. So that, that gives you that idea of a proof test that uh, the, this, this query actually is doing what the label uh, does or what, what the label is referencing. Um, I guess the only other tip I would say is that 
if you're the keeper of the flame, sometimes people will put in a query label, uh, my best report. And that, of course, is totally worthless to anyone except maybe Joe who wrote that in. So I would recommend that what you do then is, uh, is go ahead and rename that query and try to give it a more uh, descriptive title so that other staff would be able to take the benefit of that, of that query. All right, Sharon, I've uh, got some buzz. Questions? Um, not questions, but I did share with them, Chuck, the URL to our help guide that has all the field names, the screen layouts good, and things. Good, so. good, good. You're, you're, you're stealing some of my thunder, but that's okay. Well, sorry about that. We'll, we'll live with that. We'll live with that. Let me get back to you where we are here. Oop. Hang on. There we go. All right. So the query area. Report management. Well, this is the, this, and I'm not talking about modifying reports, but managing the reports in your system. Um, again, uh, as you know, within most all report areas, you can identify a default report, or there's one report that's identified as a default report. I always say it's like the starting quarterback, you know, and then there are, you might have three or four uh, on the bench uh, that, that do particular things. Um, uh, what to do with old or unused reports, uh, notes, report notes, uh, how do you, uh, how do you get some information on reports, uh, deadbeat and statistics, which of course are a couple of my favorite report areas. Um, we, we do recommend that you save your most often used report in, uh, a particular reporting area as the default report in that area. And um, we'll roll over to that in a second here. Uh, prune additional reports. And, and by pruning, I mean, one of the dilemmas if you've got a, a report writer is that they'll have drafts of a report, you know, roster one, roster two, roster three, and then finally roster five is the one they want, but they still have reports, roster one, two, three, and four sitting in the system. So again, um, if, if, they're, if they're clearly ones that appear to be uh, test sets or you, you've done them and you know those were, uh, those were drafts that were discarded, delete the dang things. Uh, if there are reports that you're not sure about, you can deactivate those so that uh, they're, they're not cr crowding your, your report area. Uh, how do you clean up reports? Uh, there is a report in the deadbeat area called reports by area to see the list of most frequently used reports. And this is a note here that I want to emphasize. Uh, for a lot of you, you guys have had student manager for quite a long time, which meant your original report set is probably quite old. Obviously, you've been doing some modifying and editing on ones you want. But some of the old default reports uh, or even additional reports, for instance, the reports by area, uh, it's been updated several times in the last uh, few years. Uh, the older one doesn't have as much detail. And we recommend that you delete that old report and import a new one uh, from a student manager demo by using the report import export or the export import options in the reports. Uh, make sure that if you're the modifying reports, you put notes in the report notes. And again, um, changes made, references, uh, who this query, who this report is for. Um, again, uh, sometimes you get into this. Well, this is the, this is the what is it? The document 543 report, uh, and you build it, and then you you say, where the heck is that report? Well, if you put a note in the notes that this is a document 543 report, uh, you can go into the tools in under report tools in manager and search for that keyword. Um, setting up and using report favorites. Again, um, this is something uh, for, for every user. If you've got a set of reports that you use often, set them up as their favorite, set them up as your favorite reports. Um, again, the deadbeat area, uh, that is one that has 
uh, a lot of functionality. It is a, uh, it's called deadbeat, but it is really a one line registration report. So if you're doing registration reporting, the deadbeat area is going to give you 90 ish plus percent uh, of the reports uh, or the kind of data you might need about registrations. Uh, and again, the stat reports under the statistical reports area is one that, again, one of my favorites. So um, talking, uh, yep, go ahead. While you're there, uh, can you please demo the report by area report in the deadbeat area so everybody can see that are you going there live now so i, I was look, going i look was going me. there and look so great that. minds great minds think there alike. you go so this is the deadbeat report setup and if i click additional reports uh you'll see reports by area frequency reports by frequency reports by last ran and then there's this one down here new all reports with memo and these are reports of reports. And uh, it also kind of illustrates that uh, in student manager, generally a report area uh, stays true to its, its reporting area, which in this case would be says registrations. But because of the tools that we've got available in reporting, uh, we can go into a report area and actually completely change what that report does which is what these all queries reports by area frequency does. So let's go ahead and run a couple of those. Uh, one of the things about that is that when you, do, when you want to run one of those reports, I'm going to recycle this area because I want to look at a couple. I'm just going to put course number begins with. If I could put course number begins with and pick a course number. I just need one course number that has a real course. Now, reports by area frequency. Now, what that does, it basically says, I'm not paying any attention to course data. What I'm doing is going into the report area, looking at the different areas and telling you how many times a particular report was printed. Now, in the demo data set, you'll see not a lot of these reports ever get printed. Uh, this is a, a current demo, so it doesn't have really any functional history. But in the live database, what that would let you do, and let's go over to uh, accounting course details, CE reporting. So in the CE reporting area, uh, you would have reports with an X number of, of times it was run. The idea of the predefined report you generally would like to do, especially if you have one report, you know, you got one, two, three, 253. Well, if you've got a 253 compared to twosies and onesies, you'd want to take that report and save it as the predefined report. Um, so that's something that this uh, all report preview uh, is helpful for. All right, we'll take a look at another one, which will be the new all reports with memo. Now, this is an example. Remember, I typed in a course number a minute ago. Now, I don't have to go in and look up one. I can do Alt and F1, and it will paste in the last course number I dealt with. Now, I want to go new all reports with memo. This is a report that gives you a bit more detail in that it gives you the number of times it was run. And here is uh, a case where this report still needs some modification. We need to widen the box for the run number because it's throwing asterisks there. But it tells you things like the last time it was run, who was the user, when it was last modified. Here again is a case where we would need to modify, we need to widen the length of the date field. Uh, who modified it, uh, the notes from that particular course. Um, so again, it, it gives you a census of all the reports in your system. And so again, uh, if your new all reports with memo doesn't have some of these uh, extra fields in, 
um, contact your tech or if you need help getting uh, that new report in. <clears throat> because again, I do think that's a good, uh, a good reference, if you would, a census uh, for you. All right, let me roll back to the shoe. SOPs, Standard Operating Procedures. Now, um, again, um, this is something you may have unofficial. Uh, I don't think it's a bad deal to create more of a formal. I think some of you have them. Uh, if, if you do have one that you're pretty proud of uh, and are willing to share it, uh, drop your name in the note and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll make a note and perhaps... Uh, invite people to contact you if they wanted an example of an of a standard operating procedures manual or or how to build one. Uh, we have a template available for download from the website uh, that would kind of give you a uh, outline for filling in the blanks, you know, on on uh, creating creating these for your system. Uh, again, as kind of the good news and bad news or the uh, the Ag the ecstasy and the agony of, of, of student manager is that there are a lot of different ways to do the same thing. <laughs> so that uh, if you really want things done a particular row or uh, method or, or way, uh, that standard operating procedure is probably uh, a good idea. And you can actually, once you build it, you can actually in the preference area or in the user profile, you can put a link to it in the user profile so that a user would be able to actually uh, jump to uh, jump to that, um, that SOP without having to go in and fish through their documents for that. So for instance, under edit my user profile, there is a link here that you could put in that has uh, the the link to the SOP document as wh where it's being stored on your computer, and you could jump to it without having to uh, again try to remember try to remember where that is. Okay, and you can and the Control F nine shortcut key will actually fire that particular location for you. So. All right, we are down to the hidden gems here. And again, uh, questions, if you've got questions about any of the things we've covered, we got about 10 minutes here. I've got about five in the gems, and so we can visit after that. <clears throat> one of the ones that I think is one that I think is for larger programs especially is this set lookup preference. And what we're talking about on that is that when you're looking up courses, uh, it basically by default will show you every active course in the database. Well, if I am a tech uh, or a staff member and I'm basically saying, look, I really only need to deal with my own courses. I don't care, not my job to deal with everybody else's. So the way you can do that is with the F2 key is that you go in and we say view all no date range. And I want to say, I only want to review courses where I am the coordinator. And so what you do now is if you click set filter, it will apply this rule to whenever I go to the lookup course name or lookup course numbers. Now, so now when I look up courses, I only see courses that are not canceled and the coordinator is Havlicek. And instead of multiple pages, I have everything fits on one page of my classes and I'm happy as a clam. Now, at this point, if I wanted to look up a different course, I, I can't do it uh, through the lookup routine here. So what you need to do is that when you're done, you said being uh, all about me, you can go in and clear the filter and and that will then put you back into the spot where you look up classes and now we see all 259 classes. So, <clears throat> all right, so that was the uh, uh, the F2 key, F2 key filter. Uh, the other thing is I do wanna hit is the F2 key, uh, the enrollment report. 
Uh, again, this is a quick way for you to look up course info. info. And it was originally built way back when when people said, well, look, I want a quick look at the next two weeks worth of courses without having to run a report or, or go through the whole query, blah, blah, blah thing. So we built this and we say, we send it to the screen, sort by begin date. We want the next 14 days with the courses, get the bang, there they are, 14 days with the courses, uh, start end time. There's a lot of information it actually shows here. Uh, the other thing this does is that you can actually double click on the course number, go in and edit the course. Uh, so again, uh, an alternate way to use this F2 key would be we we'll say we want to view all courses and I say I just want to look at my courses because I need to do some checking. I can go into course coordinator, all, hit the OK button, and there is my list of courses. Now that's across all including old ones. But now I can go in and look at any one of my courses. That's a have a check course. Edit it, uh, check data on it, run a quick report. And then when I'm done with it, uh, we're, we're back to the, the regular mode. So <clears throat> that, uh, that F2 on the course area uh, really gives you some powerful tools. Um, again, searching by... Uh, day of the week the course meets, uh, searching by a course location, searching by an instructor. That's one of the things uh, the, the the normal course search doesn't let you search by instructor. But if you said, well, I want to see courses in the next term here, we're going to say 0101, 23 through 0331, 23. Uh, and I want to search for uh, instructor Havlicek. Again, I only care about me. And there are the two upcoming classes that I'm the instructor for, or that have a text the instructor for. So again, that's uh, where the F2 gives you some extra functionality. Jumping on to F4, F4. And again, remember F1 key brings up the, the list of the keyboard shortcuts, including these ones. F4 is of kind of, to me, it's the deadbeat report area of the F keys in that it allows you to identify criteria about a person, about a course, and about a registration and generate a report. So again, you say, if I wanted a city equals Manhattan and I want the subject matter to be aceware, uh, let's say the student has to be from Manhattan, the course is, has to be in Aceware, and I want to know if they enrolled in the course last fall, 0901, 22 through 1231, 22. And I, I don't want to include cancel, and I hit the button, and there were four registrations. And again, just like the other one, if you double click on the ID, you can jump to the name record, if you double click on the course, whoops, that was not it. If you double click on the course, it jumps to the registration for that particular uh, um, registration. So that is the, um, the F2. Uh, then finally, this is where Sharon had, uh, was, had stolen my thunder here, uh, the help guide. And in the online, in the online help guide, which I closed my browser here. This is something that is a wonderful tool for people who have not a photographic memory of every single field in the system. But in the help guide over under student manager screen layout, which is what Sharon texted you earlier, uh, you can open up a data screen, get a view of what that screen is, hover over a particular field and it'll give you that scientific field name of what exactly this particular field is called. Was that co-hour or co-hours? Well, it, it's plural, it's co-hours. So again, as you're working with it, uh, you're able to uh, stay on target. Finally, this is, uh, are there any Star Wars fans out there? All right, uh, one of the, 
one of the Easter eggs in the system is that we have something called special sound or system sound preferences. If you click the special button, and if you have a certain set of, of uh, sound files that I can provide you, you're able to get some Star Wars creatures come in to help you. So password maintenance, we go to help and there's Yoda. Um, and again, sometimes uh, they're not everywhere, but uh, uh, there are there's little enough of it in there to keep you interested and occupied. So, Sharon, we've got five minutes. Um, folks, questions? What are the things that you want to review or Sharon things that I missed? While they're thinking, uh, some of you that have been in this system a long time, if you have ideas of best practices. Yes. Um, it, it, Chuck, we've lost your screen. I thought it was just oh, me, whoa, but we whoa, have whoa, lost whoa. Hang, your screen. Hang on a second. Let so me while you're here. bringing that up, I will share what I think is the best practice for you all, Go and that it. is do not suffer in silence. If <laughs> you are frustrated about something or you wonder if the system will do this or that, reach out to to me or your tech and we'll get you an answer. We want you to get help quick. Sometimes I hear, well, I've been struggling with this for a long time and I didn't want to bother my tech. Oh, come on, bother us. Bother us. That's what we're here for. That's so don't that's suffer funny. in silence. If there's something that's frustrating you or challenging you or you want to know if the system can do that, reach out to us. 